Good evening, fellow truth seekers, and welcome back to the book of 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 12 through 66. This is lesson 8 in the series. We'll be picking up right where we left off last week. Uh, I've entitled this Solomon's Kingly Prayer. It could have been his high priestly prayer. It could have been Solomon's prayer of dedication. Again, you'll see the focal point of our text is what Solomon prays as he dedicates the temple. So a few things by way of announcement. Uh, it is time to start planning. So uh, please take a look at your calendars and let me know which day works best for you, either October 14th or October 21st for the next, next get-together of the Truth Seekers here at my home. So please let me know. We're actually going to make the final decision this Sunday. So if you're not going to be there and you have a date that does not work for you, please let me know that uh, so we have a good feel for those people who really have hard limits on dates where they cannot attend. Uh, but either the 14th or the 21st is what I propose, and so we'll vote on that this Sunday. Last week, uh, a question came up about which came first, the Bronze Sea, um, the Brazen Sea, or even, you know, obviously if we go 500 years before that, um, the uh, Basin, the, the uh, Bronze Basin, or the Mikvah. Um, again, as I indicated in the class, I would think it would be the Brazen, uh, brazen Basin, the Bronze Sea, um, but I would have to verify. Now, the mikvah is a bath that's used for the purpose of ritual immersion and purification in Judaism. Uh, it's more than a pool. It's really because it has to be connected to a natural water source, and there's really there's rules associated with that. Um, so it's really, think of it as like a natural, a flowing water uh, place that can be used for ritual purification in Judaism. Uh, there's a lot of various rules associated with the mikvah and how the water's routed. Uh, but here's the bottom line. Mikvahs first appeared, as best we can tell, around the first century B.C. So this was well after um, the Bronze Sea. This is an ancient mikvah here, and this is a modern-day mikvah. But it, the key point was the Bronze Sea and the Brazen uh, Basin uh, predated the mikvah by a long time. And then the other thing by way of announcement, um, as you know, Mike uh, is my backup teacher, but sometimes uh, Mike is out. And so I'd like to have another backup teacher in the event that I need it. That way, uh, our, the teacher who's going to teach the class, if I'm out, is definitely coming out of our class. And so if you're interested in potentially doing that, please let me know. Please pray about it. Um, again, I'm not gone much. Um, because I enjoy teaching, but occasionally I, I do have to be away. And so if you're interested in that, um, being a backup to the backup, please let me know, but I would love to have you. So please think of, think and pray about being a backup teacher for the Truth Seekers class. Okay, so Solomon's kingly prayer, 1 Kings 8, picking up in verse 12. So last week, if you remember, um, we really looked at the final pieces of furnishing furnishings in the temple. We finished up with those things that were outside, and then we shifted to inside the temple. To be specific, as we shifted to the furnishings inside the temple, we looked at the golden altar of incense. We looked at the ten lampstands, five on the north and five on the south. And then we looked at, as the writer of Chronicles told us, the ten tables of showbread or the ten tables of the bread of presence. There were ten of them in the tabernacle. Uh, five on the north and five on the south. Um, we saw pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ in those furnishings. We made applications to our lives in those furnishings. Um, we then saw the beginning of the celebration of the dedication of the temple of God, the house of Yahweh. It was in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. Again, we are fairly certain it was during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now we observed as the priest assembled at the tent of David, exact location is un, was unknown, still unknown, but somewhere in the city of David, they packed up the tent, they put the ark on its staves, they packed up everything, and they marched the ark uh, from wherever it was in the city of Jerusalem up to the Temple Mount proper, through the crowds, through the main entrance into the temple, uh, which would have been through the vestibule, through the nave or the holy place, into the holy of holies, the inner sanctuary. Um, we talked about how they would have taken it up as prescribed by the law uh, on staves carried by the priest, and they would have taken it into the tabernacle located at the top of Mount Moriah. Again, we don't know exactly what the Ark of the Covenant looked like, but we do know this. There was a mercy seat on top of it. 
with two cherubim whose wings touched one another. The mercy seat came would, was removable off the Ark of the Covenant proper. And the only thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant was indeed the Ten Commandments, the two tables of stone written uh, by the finger of God on the front and on the back. And again, we observed as that ark was carried straight in through the only way to get to the Holy of Holies. There's only one way in, and that'll preach, obviously. Uh, and it was placed there. We imagine the veil being pulled back, the Ark of the Covenant being placed below those two 15-foot, 10-cubic cherubim. Um, and then outside, we saw this massive band of Levitical singers and musicians. There were lots of instruments, as well as 120 trumpet players shofars and they were there and they began to lift up their voice in unison they begin to play they begin to worship they been, begin to sing they been begin to praise god and as they did that the writer tells us the writer of kings tells us that the glory of god filled the temple so much so that it drove the priest out of the temple indeed we said you know we often say god was in the house today but imagine what they would have said god indeed was in the house. Now that's where we ended last week, but the celebration is not over. Again, it's a week-long celebration, but even what's going on this particular day that we're reading about is not over. So we're going to head back into the outer courtyard and see what's going on. Now to frame up everything in your mind, and again, so we're going to head back out here uh, to frame up everything in your mind and to help you get a picture, I'm going to pull a few verses up um, these will come up later in the lesson. I'm going to grab these from 2 Chronicles 6. So let's look at these. And then so picture here, this is the bronze altar, the brazen altar, and this is where we're going to be focusing our attention. So let's read 2 Chronicles 6, 12 through 13a. I'm going to cut that off. We'll pick that verse up later. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord. That would have been the brazen altar, the altar of Yahweh, in the presence of the assembly of Israel. Unpack, imagine this place packed out with people, and he spread out his hands. Solomon had made a bronze platform five cubits long. That would have been seven and a half feet. Five cubits wide. That would have been seven and a half feet. And three uh, cubits high. And had set it in the court, and he stood on it. So you should picture Solomon standing on this small, relatively small, seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet, um, bronze platform, but behind him and higher than him would have been the brazen altar. And so as you were looking at Solomon, he's elevated so that you can see him, but elevated even higher than him would have been the bronze altar. So what you should picture in your mind is the king of Israel, on top of this platform, his, hand ra his hands raised up in the air in worship to Yahweh God, and behind him, the massive 30-foot long, 30-foot wide, 15-foot in the air bronze altar where animals were sacrificed, where animals were burned. And so this is what you should be picturing in your mind. You're on the ground, and this is what you're seeing. And so again, we don't know if this was right here or somewhere over here, but just imagine if you're looking at Solomon, what you're seeing behind him, because he's not elevated high enough, he's elevated above you, but the bronze altar is actually elevated above him. And so that brings us really to our lesson as we pick up in verse 12, and Solomon begins to talk, and then he shifts to a prayer to Yahweh. And so let's get into it. Verse 12, Then Solomon said, Yahweh has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Now, as you look at verses 12 and 13, they're somewhat paradoxical, right? First Solomon acknowledges that Yahweh dwells in the thick darkness. Now, this language is very common for the nation of Israel. This is how Yahweh was described in Deuteronomy 5.22. He dwells in the thick darkness. This is how Isaiah describes Yahweh in Isaiah 45, 15. It highlights his separateness. It highlights the fact that he is high and lifted up. It is his transcendence is what theologians call it. He is God, and to some degree, he's unapproachable, and he dwells in the thick darkness. He is transcendent. But then in verse 13, Solomon indicates that the temple 
This exalted house, we'll talk more about that in a moment, is a place where Yahweh can dwell forever. So here in the same thought, and indeed the same sentence, Solomon speaks of God's separateness, but at the same time he speaks of God's nearness. He speaks of God's transcendence, that he's absolutely holy, that he's morally perfect, that he's separate from us, but then he speaks of his imminence, that he's close to us, that he's near to us, that he's approachable. And all of that is ultimately true for us only because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Were it not for the blood of Christ, God would remain the transcendent God. God would remain the God who is separate from us, and indeed he is. But the blood of Jesus Christ, um, again, opens up the way to approach God because of that blood, because we're approaching uh, based on his sacrifice for us. So Solomon prays God for being close among his people, that he would, in some kind of special way, manifest his presence in the Holy of Holies. Now keep in mind, that's only once a year on the um, Yom, Kippur, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and that's only after a lot of special preparation um, that the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Not true for you and I. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we have free access 24-7. We can go into his presence anytime. And I do want to make a point by way of application. If Solomon could rejoice that the transcendent God would dwell in the Holy of Holies and, and would somehow become close, even a little close, how much more should you and I rejoice that the transcendent God has come and not lived in the Holy of Holies or not even lived near us or down the street from us, but he lives within us. You see, I think we've gotten over the reality that God dwells in the person of the Holy Spirit in us and that everything that the temple meant, everything that it pictured, everything that it highlighted was first and foremost a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ but then secondly, it was a picture of the temple that the Lord Jesus Christ is building. You and I individually and you and I collectively. Paul told the church in Corinth 3.16, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that God's Spirit dwells in you. In fact, not only does he uh, allow you to come into his presence, he indeed invites you into these presence. Now both of these points, the transcendence and the eminence of God, are absolutely true about our God. And for the believer, the New Testament believer, Christ has opened that door. The veil has been split. We now can come boldly into his presence. But verse 13 is also messianic. This temple is going to be destroyed. But the temple that this is picturing, the Lord Jesus Christ and his body, would never be destroyed. In fact, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And God is building his church, the New Testament church, the New Testament temple, and again, it will not be thwarted. Notice Solomon says that I built you an exalted house. That means a lofty abode, a princely dwelling. I built you a princely dwelling for you, Yahweh, to dwell in. Now again, just a question by way of application. Um, if indeed this stone building overlaid with um, cedar and cypress, which is overlaid with gold, if indeed this building was a princely dwelling, if it was indeed a lofty abode, an exalted house, are you and I as the ultimate temple of God? Does our life reflect the reality that we are an exalted house for Yahweh, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? I asked the class, you know, quick question. If you could have any house you wanted, any place you wanted, they're all for sale. You're not coveting after anybody's stuff. It's all for sale, Which and, and you have the money. It's all the same price. Money's no issue. Which would it be? What would it be? Where would it be? And as you're thinking about that, and again, don't try to be all pious on me. Um, just think about it. Now let me ask you a different question. If Yahweh... If God could have any house on this planet that he wanted to dwell in, which one would it be? It'd be you and me. It would be us. That's the house that he would choose to dwell in. And that highlights that you indeed are the temple of God. And for all its beauty, it was picturing ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ and you 
as his temple. Verse 14, then the king turned around. So his hands are up. He's talking to Yahweh. He turns around and he blesses all the assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel stood. And he said, blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David, my father, saying, since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. But Yahweh said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son, who shall be born to you, shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made. For I have risen in the place of David my father, and set on the throne of Israel as Yahweh promised. And I've built the house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And there I have provided a place for the ark, that's the ark of the covenant, in which is the covenant, that's the Ten Commandments, of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now the king turns around and he blesses the entire assembly. But notice what he says. I don't know what you think he's going to say, but in blessing the entire assembly, here's what he said. And you can see it there. The king turns around. He blesses the entire assembly, verse 15, and he said, blessed be Yahweh. You see, the entire assembly is blessed in the blessing of God. When God blesses us, he bestows gifts upon us that we might use them for his glory and the furtherance of his kingdom. Now, everything you and I own, God possesses. The only way we can bless God and give him something that he doesn't already possess is when in our worship and praise of him. Those are offerings that come from us that Yahweh does not currently possess, and there we can bless Yahweh by blessing the Lord Jesus Christ, by worshiping and praising the Lord Jesus Christ. So we only bless God by worshiping God's Son. I would remind you what Philippians 2 says, um, God has given Jesus a name that is exalted above every name that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God the Father will only be worshiped as we worship him in his son. And that's how we bless him, by worshiping and praising the one who died that we might have life. Solomon goes on to thank God for many different aspects of God's faithfulness and so we'll just kind of walk through those. But notice point number one, this day God has fulfilled the promises that were made to David. God is faithful and he's fulfilled what he said. And that's how Solomon leads. And again, the question of application for us is think about all the ways that God has been faithful to you. Now, as you think about this and you think about God's faithfulness and you think about his faithfulness to Solomon and in particular his faithfulness to David, David did not get to actually see these promises fulfilled. He only saw them afar off. Now, he did draft up the plans for the temple. Yahweh used him to do that. He embraced them in that sense and he trusted God for the ultimate fulfillment. And that's a good picture for us and a good reminder for us. We may not see all the promises fulfilled in this life, but we can trust that Yahweh indeed will. The good news is we get to see many of them by faith even before uh, they're fulfilled. Now, because this prayer is repetitious, we're going to pick up many of these points as we advance. And so I won't reiterate the points we just read over. We're going to pick them up in the prayer. Uh, but I would just point out that, again, the writer of Kings tells us the only thing in the ark right now is the Ten Commandments. And again, we made the point by, of, by, of the point of application uh, that the Ten Commandments being the only thing in the ark. God could have placed a hundred trinkets in there to remind us of different aspects, but he placed one thing at this point. There's just one, and that's the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. And that reminds us the high value that God has on his word 
and on his commandments. And if God has a high value like that, I would argue we should have a high value like that. Verse 22, then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel, and he spread out his hands. So we talked about that. We get what's going on. Now I do want to, again, I painted you the picture that he was there on this platform. We pulled that from Second Chronicles. His hands are up in the air. Um, now I do want you to see something else that the writer of Kings doesn't tell us here. He'll tell us it at the end, but I want you to see it now because I want you to see the picture. So I'm going to quickly jump back to Second Chronicles, except I'm going to pick on verse 13 where I left off. So I left off when I read this to you before that he stood on the platform in the middle of verse 13. So let's pick up there then. Then he knelt on his knees in the presence of all the assembly of Israel with his hands spread towards heaven. So now in your mind, you should have Solomon on a bronze platform, um, seven feet up in the air. You should have him on his knees, his hands lifted up, the massive uh, bronze altar behind him while he stands on this smaller bronze platform. That's what you should have in your minds, in your mind. And again, that platform is seven and a half feet long. And if I said seven feet tall, that's not right. It's about I think four or five feet tall. And so there he is with his hands lifted up. And what a lesson for Israel. Here's the king of Israel on his knees, praising the God of Israel, giving his worship to the God of Israel. And that's a great lesson for you and I as well. Now he begins to pray. And so what we're going to do is we're going to work our way through that prayer. Um, again, we're, we're just going to sort of pull our way through it trying to get all the pictures. Um, but as you think about this, as you think about Solomon with this bronze, this massive bronze altar behind him, why do you think we generally close our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, saying, in the name of Jesus, amen? Now, obviously, because the Bible tells us that, because Jesus said that, um, but it reminds us that Jesus atoned for our sins. As, as Solomon was here, the bronze altar behind him, the nation of Israel was being reminded there must be an atoning sacrifice. There is no remission of sins without an atoning sacrifice. Verse 20, oops, excuse me, verse 23. And he said, this is Solomon, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You have kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand have fulfilled it this day. Now, therefore, O Lord, Yahweh, God of Israel, keep for your servant David, my father, what you have promised him, saying, you shall not lack a man to set before me on the throne of Israel, if only your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me as you have walked before me. Verse 26, Now therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. The prayer begins with adoration to Yahweh. And this adoration really manifests itself in five declarations about God. So let's just walk through these very briskly. Verse 23, there is no God anywhere like you. God, you are incomparable. Now, as you think about that, I would argue if he thought Yahweh was incomparable, he did not have a clue. Consider what we know that he did not know. God stepped out of heaven into time in the person of Jesus Christ. By the way, all of this was announced in advance with amazing accuracy in the Old T Testament. Jesus went to Calvary and there bore our sins, paid our sin debt to reconcile us back to God. Having died at Calvary, three days later, he rose from the grave, proving his defeat of death and hell, having obtained victory. If Solomon could say God is incomparable, I would say he doesn't have a clue. God is indeed incomparable, and his salvation plan is unimaginable and incomparable. God, our God, 
Jesus Christ is incomparable. Number two, he keeps covenant. He's a covenant keeping God. If he makes, if he enters into a covenant with you, he keeps his end of the covenant. If he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved, he will keep his end of the covenant. And I would remind you that not only that, Jesus is the mediator, the go-between of this new covenant, Hebrews 12, 24. Number three, he is the God. Yahweh is the God who displays steadfast love to his people. Now, again, if Solomon could see within Yahweh a God who displayed steadfast love, what we see in Christ is not only steadfast love, it's lavish love, it's outlandish love, it's scandalous love. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You ready for scandalous love? Greater love has no man than this, that God would take up on human form and lay down his life for us. That is lavish. That is scandalous. That is steadfast love uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ, from God. Number four, God is a God who keeps his promises. And then Solomon gives examples, namely the promises made to David, his father, about the kingdom and about the throne and about the house. And so Solomon's point is, God, you are a God who keeps promises. And that's good news for every believer today. The promises of God are yes and amen. What God has promised, he will do. God's word is reliable. He doesn't go back on any promises. It, he never hits a case where, oh, I didn't think about that. I'm not going to be able to make it happen. I do. He does not. Now, it is important that we see this. Solomon fully understood, and this is going to come up next week, um, that for the promises of David to all be fulfilled, he had to follow Yahweh. Do you see that in verse 25b? So here's the promise. Now, therefore, O Lord God, keep for your servant David, my father, what you promised him, saying, you shall not lack a man to set before me on the throne of Israel. There's no period. There's a comma. If only your sons pay close attention to walk, close attention to their way, to walk before me as you walked before me. This is a conditional promise, and this condition is Solomon's obedience. The nation is riding on Solomon's obedience. Solomon's throne is riding on Solomon's obedience. And here's the spoiler alert. Solomon was disobedient. Solomon failed to keep his end of the covenant. The good news is Jesus Christ, another son of David, another one who descended from Solomon, did not. He kept every word uh, of every, both active and passive obedience. And so what Solomon failed to obtain, the Lord Jesus Christ has obtained. It reminded me as I puzzled on this, um, even there in Isaiah chapter 9, this promise was out there. Unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders and he shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. He will perform it. And so what Solomon could not secure, because that was never the end game, the end game was always the Lord Jesus securing it. And notice, though, in verse 26, he says, let your word be confirmed. That means let your word be established. It's aman is the Hebrew word. It's where we get the word amen. And indeed, God will keep his word. The good news is what Solomon failed to secure, the Lord Jesus secured for you and I, namely eternal life. He now sits on the throne of David, and he will forever. Verse 27. But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heavens cannot contain you, Yahweh, how much less this house that I have built. So in this prayer, this is an invitation, but also a recognition that God cannot be cooped up in a house. God cannot be corked in a 30 by 30 by 30 foot stone, wood, and gold room. It's the recognition that God is acquiescing to somehow dwell with us because of his grace, but the heavens indeed can't contain him. 
Now, Solomon recognizes two points uh, that theologians use to describe God. One is his omnipresence. God is everywhere, so he can't be corked into a room that's 30 by 30 by 30 feet, a cube. But he's not only omnipresent, he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. God cannot be corked up anywhere. He's the unchained line. But Solomon recognized that. He understood God's dwelling in the Holy of Holies um, was really for man's benefit. God wasn't actually, that wasn't like the only place he was. But God was in a special way there acquiescing to be with his people. Verse 28. Yet have regard to the prayer. So in other words, the heavens can't contain you, but Lord, move in. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. So have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, Yahweh my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place which you said my name shall be there that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers toward this place and listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place and listen in heaven, your dwelling place. Wait a minute, I thought his dwelling place was in the temple. Solomon gets it. And when you hear, forgive. Solomon is asking the omnipresent God to dwell among his people to hear not only Solomon's prayer and plea today, but to hear the prayers and pleas of God's people in the future. And this brings us to point number five of Solomon's points about why he is praising Yahweh, and that, that is the um, omnipresent, all-powerful God is also an intimate God. The heavens cannot contain him, yet he is choosing to dwell among his people. Now, this desire to be among his people would be more realized when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and for 33 and a half years tabernacles among his people. He puts on sandals with his people. He walks in the dust and the sin and the filth with his people. But it's ultimately realized as God moves into his people in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. Our God is an intimate God, and Solomon is praising God for being this intimate God. Now, point of application. God did not need a temple. Israel needed the temple. Israel needed God close. Israel needed God amongst them. Israel needed God there with them, leading them. God didn't need a stone building. Rather, God did this because of his grace. And I would argue for New Testament believers, we need everything that this temple represents. Obviously, we need the Lord Jesus Christ, the first thing it represents, but equally, we need the church. We need the church of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Now, what's about to happen, beginning in verse 31 and moving forward, Solomon is going to set up seven examples of things that could happen and what God's people should do. So, what Solomon is asking God to do in response, in other words, is set up with this grammatical formula. If this happens, and if God's people do this, then God, will you do this? You see this if-then formula repeated over and over again seven times as he sets up seven unique scenarios where Solomon says, if this happens and you do this, then God, will you do this? Now, last week, before we look at these, within each piece of the first furnishings in the uh, temple, we saw application for our lives as well as pictures of the Messiah. And in almost every case, we saw multiple things. Here in Solomon's sevenfold intercession, we should see prayers for ourselves. We should see prayers for others. But we should also see beautiful reminders about King Jesus, who is the greater Solomon, who indeed intercedes for his people. We should see the king of Israel praying for Israel. We should see the ultimate king, Jesus, praying for his people. So as we dive into this, do not forget that. Verse 31. The first one is a prayer for justice. A prayer for justice. Verses 31 and 32. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes and swears his oath before your altar in this house, then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the guilty by bringing the conduct in his own head and vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. Now this prayer, this idea should seem fairly familiar to us 
This is like the case of the dead baby and the kidnapped baby, 1 Kings 3, 16 to 28. This is exactly what happened. There's this case where no one can resolve it. And what Solomon is praying is if something like this happens, then the two men are to come and make this oath before the house of Yahweh. And Yahweh, I'm asking you to hear and to judge and to do so by condemning the guilty and vindicating the righteous. Now, we don't know exactly how Solomon was thinking this was going to play out or exactly what it would look like. It could have been done, I think, two ways. Number one, what Solomon could have been saying is after these two men uh, make this oath to you and they leave the place, will you pour out judgment on the head of the guilty and will you vindicate the righteous, the one who is telling the truth? And that could be it. It could be that simple. But equally, what he could have been saying is you're going to come to the temple, you're going to take this oath, and then the high priest is going to decide using the Urim and Thummim, which is located in the breast piece of judgment, who is right, who is guilty, and who is innocent. And so as I said that, you know, as I thought about this this week, I'm thinking, okay, we haven't talked about this at all. So let's just look at a few things. First, let's look at what I'm talking about in Exodus 28.30. And in the breastpiece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall be bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. Now in Numbers 27, 21, we're told that these could be used to make decisions. It appears to be yes, no, or A, B, or 1, 2, you know, this or that decision. But equally, in 1 Samuel 28, 6, we're told that Saul consulted the Urim and Thummim, so through the high priest, and didn't get an answer. So there was some kind of way where whatever these likely stones were, they could come back with no answer at all. And when Saul consulted them through the high priest, he received no answer at all. So we don't know if it was two stones you pulled out and they both had to say the same thing for yes or the same thing for no or the same thing for person one or the same thing for person two, and if they were mixed that was no answer from God. We just don't know. But it could be that what Solomon's saying is, come take this oath, and then the high priest is going to reach into his chest piece. He's going to pull out the Urim and the Thummim, and the decision will be made by Yahweh. Now, having said all that, I just want to briefly talk about the uniform of the high priest. Beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the white linen tunic, Exodus 39, 27. That's the undergarment. On top of that, we have the blue robe, with the golden bells and the pomegranates on the hymn, that's Exodus 28, 34, Exodus 39, 22 through 26. Over the blue robe, we have the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet, Exodus 28, 4, Exodus 39, 2 through 5. And that's located here above the blue robe. On the shoulders of the ephod, we have the onyx stones with the names of the tribes of Israel, six Stone, six names on each stones, and these are located on top of the ephod on the high priest's shoulder. And you can read about that in Exodus 29, or excuse me, 28, 9 through 12, and 39, 6 and 7. We have the sash, Exodus 39, 29. Number six, we have the turban, Exodus 28, uh, 4, and 39, 28. And on the turban is a gold plate that says, Holy to the Lord, H O L Y, holy to the to the Lord, Exodus 28, 36, oh, excuse me, and uh, 39, 30, and 31. And then seventh, we have the breastplate with the 12 stones, each one of them representing a tribe of Israel, each engraved with a name. And in the breastpiece were these two, the Urim and the Thummim, these two likely stones that the high priest used somehow to make decisions. And it could have been that what Solomon is talking about is when you have one of these tough cases, you go and take this oath, the high priest reaches in there and he determines the answer as given by Yahweh. We don't know what he means, but here's what we do know. We run into things all the time where we do not have enough information to make an informed decision. Often we will pray, this is exactly the point, Lord, will you judge the guilty and vindicate the righteous? We hear about some something that happened with election fraud or something that happened with theft or something, and we're not sure which story is true. We pray, God, would you sort this out and would you vindicate the one who's in the right? But it does remind us, this messianic as well, Jesus is the ultimate and final judge. He does and will judge righteously and in righteousness, and he will render every man according to his works. 
every man will be judged either in Christ and Christ paid for their sins or they'll be judged on their own. They'll be found guilty and they'll be cast into a devil's hell. But this does remind us as we think about the first prayer, this does remind us of the Lord Jesus Christ, this prayer for justice. One day, ultimate justice will be answered. This brings us to the second prayer, picking up in verse 33, and that's a prayer for rescue. A prayer for rescue. When your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you, and if they turn again to you and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house, then here in heaven, forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave to their fathers. Now notice Solomon understood moral depravity. He understood theirs, he understood stands ours. When the Israel is defeated before their enemy because of their sin. So Israel went out to many battles, and by the way, they won many of them. They were victorious quite a bit, but sometimes... AI would be one example, or when the Ark of the Covenant was lost to the Philistines, another example. They're not victorious, and it's always, or most of the time, because of sin. And here Solomon is praying, when they turn back to you, even when they fall into defeat because of their sin, when they turn back to you, then will you hear from heaven, will you forgive them, and will you restore them? Now this is messianic. It's on the basis of the atonement that the king is praying there's a way back for fallen sinners. And I would remind you and I, there's always a way back in Christ. We see the picture of the good shepherd who's out looking. He has a hundred sheep. He's out looking for the stray, the one that's roamed off. As believers, John told us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We, our feet are washed. We're restored to a right standing with God. We never lost our salvation. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is even when a believer sins, this reminds us that in Jesus, there's a way, way back. And that's what Solomon was praying for the nation of Israel. When they sin, God, would you have a way back? And no doubt he did over and over and over again. Number three, a prayer for provision. A prayer for provision, verses 35 and 36. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you. Again, we see what's going on. If they pray toward this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel, when you teach them the good way in which they should walk and grant rain upon your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. So Israel was an agrarian people. They lived off the land. Obviously, they had cattle as well. And sometimes God would use that land to chastise them because of their sin. He would withhold the rain, impact their food production because of their sin. That's exactly what we read in Deuteronomy 11, 16, and 17. I won't quote it. You can look it up if you like. But the point is, God would chasten his people because of their sin by withholding the rain. Um, we're going to see this play out in King Ahab's life in 1 Kings 17. So, you know, a uh, month and a half from now, probably. But here's what I would say our application for you and I today. When we feel like something's missing in our life, when we feel like something is being withheld, when we see the economy tanking or our bank account tanking, or we can't make our house payment, let's always take a moment to ensure it's not happening in response to sin in our life. Now, every calamity and every disaster that comes into our life is not because of sin. Um, and I'm not saying that. But let's just take a moment to make sure that God's not withholding the rain because we've sinned. Because I would remind you, Hebrews 12, 6, the Lord disciplines the ones he loves. And he chastens every son whom he receives. The Lord loves us so much that he will not leave us in our sins. He will chastise us with the goal of bringing us back. And you saw in these verses, the goal was restoration. The goal was bringing them back. They acknowledge their sins and they uh, to have a way back to Yahweh. This brings us to uh, the fourth thing, and that's a prayer for deliverance. Look at it in verse 37. And if there's a famine in the land, and if there's pestilence or bright, blight, or mildew, or locust, or caterpillar, if their enemy besieges them in the land at the gates, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever 
prayer, whatever plea is made by any man or by all your people, Israel, each, each knowing the affliction of his own heart, stretching out his hands toward this house, then hear in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you, you only know the hearts of all the children of mankind that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land that you gave our fathers. Now this is similar to number three, but we have additional natural disasters as well as even the enemy at the gate. But you do see where the real plague is, I think. I think it's verse 38. The real plague is in our hearts, the affliction of our own heart. Uh, but once again, what we see is things that come right from Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy 28, 38, and 39. We're going to see this play out in 2 Kings 18 into 19. Uh, as the king of Assyria besieges Jerusalem, but Hezekiah is going to pray, and God is going to miraculously deliver in 2 Kings 19, 35 through 37. So these things that are Solomon are praying are coming out of Deuteronomy as things that will happen when the nation sins, and we're going to see them all play out in the book of Kings. Um, now again, we should not see every natural disaster as a necessary response to someone's sin, but we should see every natural disaster as a chance to pray for those impacted and to pray that people who do not know God would be drawn to God and people who've drifted away from God would be pulled back to God. Um, and so this gives us a chance to pray, even in these tough times, for others. Now, these are the first four, and so we'll now transition to look at the last three. So the first one in verses 41 through 40, 43 is a prayer for outsiders, a prayer for outsiders. Likewise, let me get a drink of water, y'all. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays to this house, the foreigner, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel. And that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. Now, I suspect for the Hebrews present that day, Solomon's prayer here at point number five um, seemed a little foreign to them. This is a Jewish temple. This is about us. This is a Hebrew temple. This is not about the nations. But I would remind us, the temple was always to be a house of prayer for all people. If you remember Mark 11, Jesus had ran out the money changers and he was now teaching. And the money changers, by the way, were in the court of the Gentiles. He had ran them out and he's now teaching in Mark eleven seventeen, 17. And he says, quote, is it not written my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? Jesus is not saying I decided today it's going to be a house of prayer for all nations. He's quoting Isaiah 56, 7 and saying, isn't it written that my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations, all of these Gentile peoples, and you've turned the Gentile court into a place where you're buying and selling, you're merchandising, you've turned it into a den of robbers? Solomon envisioned the day when foreigners would hear about the great covenant-keeping God and turn to him by faith. Man, that is prophetic. But it also happened even in the Old Testament, even in the book of Kings. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we're going to see this mighty Syrian captain named Naaman who turns to Yahweh by faith. But notice what Solomon says, Lord, would you hear the foreigner from heaven? Would you answer his prayer and would you forgive his sin in order that he would be a beaming beacon of the reality that all the people of the earth need to know your name and need to fear you. Many points of application, right? We should be praying for the salvation of the lost, absolutely. Our churches should be places of prayer. They should be places, they should be a place of prayer for all the nations. They should be a place where people are comfortable. They're not, we're not making them uncomfortable. Now I got some news. The gospel is going to make them uncomfortable. If we're faithful with the gospel and we're talking about the blood of Jesus Christ and we're talking about they lost and they need to be saved and God's judgment is abiding upon them in their lost condition, that will be uncomfortable. But we should not make them uncomfortable. We should do everything we can to make it comfortable for them 
as the uncomfortable gospel comes to convict them of their sin and, and hopefully, prayerfully, uh, through the power of the Spirit, bring them the faith in Jesus Christ. And this was the end game the whole time. Jesus said this in John 12, 32, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men, men from all nations, kindreds and tongues, to myself. The end game of Calvary, the chief game, has always been the nations. Number six is a prayer for victory. If your people go out to battle against the enemy, by whatever way you shall send them, and they pray to the Lord toward this city that you have chosen and the house I have built for my name, then hear in heaven their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. Now, what Solomon is praying for is when God sends the nation out on holy warfare. God is directing them to go put down another nation. He's saying, Lord, would you hear them? Would you hear from heaven and would you maintain their cause? Now, this does not have direct application that God's going to bless the U.S. Army or U.S. Navy or Russian Army or Ukrainian Army for that matter. The greater application is the spiritual warfare that the church is engaged in every day. You and I go out to battle, whether we realize it or not, every day. And we should be praying one another praying for one another, um, that God would maintain our brother and sister's cause. We do not wrestle with flesh and blood, Ephesians 6, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We should pray for ourselves. We should pray for others. We should pray for the souls of men and women, for that's really what's at stake. This is a spiritual battle, and the ultimate application of point number six is spiritual warfare. And then finally, point number seven, the final point where he sums it all up, a prayer for forgiveness, a prayer for forgiveness. And if they sin against you, it now encompasses everything. Everything that I've left off the table, Solomon says, I'm now gonna bring in in point number seven. If they sin against you, for there's no one who does not sin. He's right, Romans three, there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned, we're together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. But if they sin against you, for there's no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them and give them to the enemy so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, we have sinned and acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their enemies who carried them captive, and pray to you toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city you have chosen, and the house that I have built for your name, then hear in heaven your dwelling. You see that if and then? Then hear from heaven your dwelling place, their prayer and their play, and maintain their cause, and forgive your people who sinned against you, and all the transgressions that they've committed against you, and grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. For they are your people and your heritage, which you brought out of Egypt from the midst of the iron furnace. Let your eyes be open to the plea of your servant and to the plea of your people Israel, giving ear to them whenever they call to you. For you separated them from among all peoples of the earth to be your heritage, as you declared through Moses your servant when you brought our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. Last but by no means least, Solomon prays for forgiveness in any scenario. If they're carried away captive, please forgive. Now, sadly, Solomon's if is going to become an absolute reality. This is almost prophetic. The nation will be carried away captive. Three waves, the final one ending in 586 BC, when the southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin are taken off ultimately into Babylonian captivity. The book of Daniel and our brothers, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all part of that story. Again, Solomon was praying directly from the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy 28, 49, and we see these events really play out. But here's something that really answers a question for us. In the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6, after the decree is made uh, that no, they can't pray to any other god but the king, Daniel went home, opened his window, and prayed toward Jerusalem. Now, why in the world would Daniel pray toward Jerusalem? What does it matter? Well, let me tell you why, I think. I think he believed the writer of Kings meant what he said. Verse 48, if they repent with all their mind, he had, even though he hadn't sinned, 
and with all their heart in the land of their enemies, that's where he was, who carried them captive, and they pray to you toward their land. You see, I think Daniel believed literally that God would keep his promise if they did the ifs of what Solomon said. Now, just by way of application, I know none of uh, the truth seekers are carried away captive today. I'm, I haven't learned of any that are. Um, but you know, sin can get a stronghold in your life. And before you know it, you can be carried much further than you ever imagined. You're a captive to sin. Even though you're a Christian, you've been carried far away from the camp. And I would just remind you, you're one step away from coming home. If you find yourself outside, outside the city because sin has drawn you away, cry out to God. He will forgive and he will restore. Uh, this reminds us that, that, that Jesus Christ hears our prayers just like he heard Daniel's. This reminds us of the Messiah, whoever lives to make intercession for us, whoever lives to come to our aid. But this really closes Solomon's seven prayers that touch every situation in life. We're reminded that everyone needs prayer, including us, and we're reminded that we should be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're reminded that God hears our prayers, um, and as we close out Solomon's seven petitions, I do just want to say one more thing about seven. And it comes from Peter. Peter came up to the Lord and said, Lord, how often, Matthew 18, will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, if this is true in human relations, how much more true as God's children through the blood of Jesus Christ? Just another seven I found interesting. Verse 54. So we're now coming to the end. Now Solomon finished offering all this prayer and plea to Yahweh. He arose from before the altar of the Lord where he had knelt with his hands outstretched to heaven. And he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be Yahweh who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise which he spoke by Moses his servant. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us or forsake us, that, we, that he may incline our hearts to him, to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his rules, which he commanded our fathers. Let these words of mine, with which I plead, pleaded before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night. And may he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day requires, that all the peoples of the earth may know the Lord is God. Yahweh is God, and there is no other. Let your heart, therefore, be wholly true to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments as at this day. The king stands up. He's been kneeling for this entire prayer. These seven petitions have been done on his knees. He arises, and he stops as he started blessing the people by blessing the people's God, by pronouncing a blessing on Yahweh. He reiterates that God has fulfilled his promises. In verse 56, not one word has failed. He asked that the Lord continue to be with them as he was with their fathers. He asked that he may he never leave us or forsake us. We have that in Christ. We have that promise. He will never leave us or forsake us. And may he incline our hearts toward his. And man, that's my prayer for me every day. God, don't leave my heart to me. Please, through the power of your word and your spirit, turn my heart to you. Verse 660 reminds us that their lofty place had a purpose, and that was that all the peoples of the earth may know that Yahweh is God. Our lofty position as the body of Christ has a purpose, and that's that we may, that the world may know that Jesus is Lord and that he died so that they could have a relationship with God. And then we join Solomon in these closing words, let your heart therefore be wholly true to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes, keeping his commandments, as it is this day. Verse 62, then the king 
And all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. Solomon offered as peace offerings to the Lord 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the people of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. The same day the king consecrated the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered the burnt offering and the grain offering and the fat pieces of the peace offerings because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small, that 30 by 30 foot altar, was too small to receive the burnt offerings and the grain offerings and the fat pieces of the peace offerings. So Solomon held the feast at that time and all Israel with him, a great assembly from Lebo Hamath to the brook of Egypt before the Lord our God seven days. And on the eighth day, he sent the people away and they blessed the king and they went to their homes joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had shown to David his servant and to Israel his people. Now notice the sacrifices that were made that day. 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep dedicating the house of Yahweh. And what we sh generally when we hear these kinds of numbers with these animals, there's something in us that recoils. What should cause the recoil is these animals are dying because of our sin. These animals are dying to remind you and I that sin has separated us from a holy God. These animals are dying to remind us that we need something different, something better. We need the sinless son of God who would shed his own blood and one time to redeem us. These are painting a picture for Israel and for us. Blood must be shed because of our sin. And as you look at verse 30, 64, rather, the implication seems to be that Solomon built like an altar there in the middle of court because all the animals being sacrificed couldn't be handled on that 30 foot by 30 foot brazen altar. We're reminded in verse 65 that this was a week long celebration that ended on the eighth day. Indeed, this is the Feast of Booze or the Feast of Tabernacles. We're told that there was a great assembly that came from Lebo Hamath all the way um, to the brook of Egypt. This is just another way of saying his entire kingdom. This is the uh, Hamath. This is the entry of Hamath, Lebo Hamath all the way to the brook of Egypt. This is the same thing that we read, just different words in 1 Kings 4.21, where Solomon, we're told Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates up here to the land of the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. So this is just another way of saying um, the entrance of Hamath all the way to the brook of Egypt. Verse 66, and then after this week-long celebration, he sent the people home. They blessed the king. They went to their homes in great, with great joy, gladness of heart for all that Yahweh had done. This was an amazing celebration, an amazing high day for the nation of Israel. This was probably the greatest single day for the nation. It is truly tragic that the nation fell from this lofty position, but it reminds us Man could never do the job for us. We were always waiting for the son who was going to be born to us. Unto us, this child would be born. Unto us, this son would be given. The government would be up on his shoulders. He would be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He, the end game was always Jesus Christ. And we see that even here in the Old Testament. That was always the end game. I submit unto you or present to you 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 12, all the way to the end of chapter 8, verse 66. Lord willing, next week we'll, I plan to do uh, chapter 9 in the first half of chapter 10. So until we meet again, either here on YouTube, if you're not make it, able to make the lesson, or in Sunday school, God bless you. And by the way, this Sunday, our one-year celebration is a Sunday school class. So if you can make it, please make it. Um, again, we're celebrating our first birthday, our one-year birthday as a Sunday school class. God bless you guys. See you Sunday.